All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the week five review for Math 2413. Um, mostly in this review, we'll be covering, uh, finished going over a few more examples of the actual definition of a derivative, and then we'll finally get into some of our derivative rules that give us easier ways to take the derivative. So let's jump right in. You remember the definition of a derivative was the limit as h goes to 0 for f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. And we call this the derivative of x. And you'll see it denoted f prime of x. You can sometimes also see it denoted the derivative with respect to x of f of x. Um, if your function is specifically like y equals to f of x, you could also see it written like y prime. And be another way or two that I'm forgetting. Um, you might occasionally see y with a dot over it, but this one's really rare. Um, so these are all different ways to just say I'm talking about the derivative. And if you'll recall, this is our definition. So let's say we wanted to use our definition of a derivative to find the derivative of, let's go with one of our trig functions, sine of x. Well, in order to find the derivative, I simply plug it in to my definition. I say the limit as h goes to 0 of sine of x plus h minus sine of x all over h. And in order to solve this, I actually need to use a trig identity here. And that trig identity is the sine of a plus b is equal to sine of a times cosine of b plus cosine of a times sine of b. So in this case, I can let my a be x and my b be h. This gets me the limit as h goes to 0 of sine of x cosine of h plus sine of h cosine of x. Um, and it probably wasn't good, but I uh, actually switched these around and put my sign first. So if you're a bit confused on that, I just switched the order around a bit. And of course, we still have minus sine of x all over h. Perfect. So from here, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to try and split up my, into my uh, limit. And to do that, I'm going to rewrite it like so. The limit as h goes to 0 of sine x cosine h minus sine of x all over h plus the limit as h goes to 0 of sine x cosine h over h. Is that right? Oh, nope, that is not right. It should be sine of h cosine x, sorry. And where I get all this from is I just take sine x cosine h, sine x cosine h, minus sine x minus sine x. That's my first part. And my second part sine x cosine, uh, sine h cosine x. And it seems all kind of arbitrary why I'm doing this. Um, but the big idea is I actually wanted to get it so that I could take out my sine of x's right here and group my sine of x's. Um, so in fact, because I'm taking the limit with respect to h, sine of x is almost like a constant. So I'm going to just pull it out of my limit. And this gives, gives us the limit as h goes to 0 of cosine h minus 1 over h. And same thing here. I'm going to pull out my cosine of x because 
I'm taking that limit with respect to h, so cosine of x is a constant in that case. All right, now I'm actually ready to evaluate my limit because both of these limits that I found or that I've made right here are both special trig limits that you know. So the second one, what does that go to? Just goes to one. And this first one? We, we stopped at the first one in my class. <laughs> so I don't know. All right, um, what if we factor out a negative one as well? What does that limit go to? Is it a bit more familiar? One. Not quite one. Sine of h. One minus cosine of h over h. This one actually goes to zero. Um, so these are really your two special trig limits. Sine of x over x, you guys all know pretty well. This one is one. Your other one is like the cosine equivalent. It's 1 minus cosine of x all over x goes to 0. Um, all right, so if we continue simplifying, we have minus sine of x multiplied by 0 plus cosine of x multiplied by 1. And this gives us just cosine of x. And this is the derivative of sine of x. And does that match with what you learned in class? We kind of, she stopped pretty short, so. Right, right. Um, have you actually covered like the derivative of sine cosine yet? We covered sine, but not cosine. All right, cool. So you know that the derivative of sine is cosine. And that is the actual uh, limit definition of why uh, the derivative of sine is cosine. Um, it is usually a lot easier to just remember that the derivative is cosine. Um, any questions regarding that whole process? How to use the definition of a derivative? Nope. All right. Then let's go ahead and do some practice problems. Um, yeah? Can you actually scroll back up so I can write a little trick? Oh, sure, go for it. I'll give you a minute to copy down anything you want. I'm actually going to start writing down the practice problems. And I'll give you a couple of minutes to work on these two practice problems. Um, they do involve a lot of algebra, I'm sorry, but uh, I think you'll end up running into problems like these, so good luck. <laughs>
sure it only is on the hand bottom, right? Because you need to multiply by one to not change it. Yeah. Yep, that's how it is. So, how I like to think of fractions and fractions is it's difficult to think about what's on top and what's on bottom, right? So, um, we have a situation where it's kind of like, right? Well, I like to think of this as just C over 1, and I know that dividing fractions is the same as multiplying by the reciprocal. Thank you. 
now made the dinosaur. Oh. It's a lot easier to think about, right? <laughs> All right, how's it going, people who are online? You get any answers? All right. <laughs> yes, you hope. Nice. Yes. Um, all right, let's start going over the first one um, just so we stay on track. So. There we go. So first off, for our first one, we know that we'll just start by writing out our definition. Our derivative is the limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h, so x plus h minus 2 over x plus h plus 3 minus f of x, so minus x minus 2 over x plus 3. And I put parentheses uh, in this section to make sure that I don't lose my negative right here, because that's important that I keep my negative, and then all of this is going to be over h. Well, the first thing we want to do is we would like to combine our fractions on top. And the best way to do that, unfortunately, is multiply by the denominator of the other. Um, so this would be x plus h minus 2 times x plus 3 over x plus h minus 3. This should be a plus 3, shouldn't it? Yep, plus 3 times x plus 3 minus x minus 2 times x plus h plus 3 all over x plus 3 times x plus h plus 3. All of this is all over h. Cool. And now it's just time to do some fun distributing. So on top, I'm going to have x squared plus 3x plus hx plus 3h minus 2x minus 6. Um, I think I drew something here. Cool. That is my first fraction. Uh, my second one, I'm going to have minus all of x squared plus xh plus 3x minus 2x minus 2h minus 6. All of this is going to be over, I'm going to go ahead and combine my denominators, h times x plus 3 times x plus h plus 3. Good so far? Cool. Now I can distribute my negative. This is x squared plus 3x. I'm also going to put all of my terms with an h at the end. So x squared plus 3x minus 2x minus 6 minus x squared minus 3x plus 2x plus 6. And now for my h terms, plus hx plus 3h minus xh uh, plus 2h. Did I miss anything? I don't think so. All right. And all of this is going to be over h times x plus 3 times x plus h plus 3. Now let's see what will cancel. We've got x squared cancels with x squared. Positive 3x cancels with negative 3x. Minus 2x cancels with positive 3x. Positive 2x minus 6 with positive 6. All right, and also hx and xh. And then I can combine these two into 5h. And then I can also cancel out, because this is all that's left on top, I'm going to cancel this h with this h. Perfect. And now we're left with y prime is the limit as h goes to 0 of just 5 on top over x plus 3, x plus h plus 3. 
And now we can just evaluate our limit, plug in 0 for h, and we get 5 over x plus 3 squared. All right, any questions? Okay. Um, and you guys have learned the quotient rule? <laughs> okay. Um, let's really quick just go over how to solve this using the quotient rule because that's clearly a lot easier and that's why we like to use our special derivative rules rather than the definition of a derivative every time. If we wanted to solve for the derivative of y equals x minus 2 over x plus 3 using the quotient rule, well, it is, I remember using like a, a mnemonic low d high minus high d low over low low. And that says I take my low term, multiply it by the derivative of the high term. So the derivative of x minus 2 is just 1 by uh, our power rule, which we'll cover later, I guess. <laughs> um, minus i, so the top times the derivative of the, all over the bottom squared. And that's, that gives us x plus 3 minus x plus 2 over x plus 3 squared, which is 5 over x plus 3 squared. And that is a whole lot easier. Wait, you multiply that by 1? Um, yes, so this is the derivative of the bottom term. This is the derivative of the top term. Our product, or sorry, our quotient rule says we take, let's see if there's a pointer here. Um, so do you remember your power rule? We'll cover it later, and, and then I'll come back to this. Sound good? Yeah. All right. <laughs> um, because other, I don't want to do the whole definition of a derivative for just x minus 2. Um, all right, let's cover our second one. y is equal to the square root of x. I said it was plus 2? Plus 3. Right, perfect. Well, then we can, of course, start by writing out our definition of a derivative. And usually to solve these, we do want to multiply by the conjugate. So that would be root x plus h plus 3 plus the square root of x plus h. Sorry, that should be an x plus 3, not h. all over the same thing. And the reason we do this is because that will cancel our square roots on top. So we would have, if we distribute, square root of h plus 3 squared is, sorry, what am I saying? The square root of x plus h plus 3 squared is x plus h plus 3. Then you would have minus this times this plus this times this. Since those are equal, they cancel out. And then we have minus the square root of x plus 3 squared, so minus x minus 3, because I would go ahead and distribute my negative. All of this is still going to be over h times the square root x plus h plus 3 plus square root of x plus 3. OK, I'm going to cancel what I can on top. That's going to be x and 3. And that leaves me with just an h on top. Times the square root of x plus h plus 3 plus square root x plus 3. I can cancel again my h on top and bottom. Oh boy, this could be life changing. Yes, okay, perfect. Um, and then I can just evaluate my limit um, by plugging in 0 for h. That gives me 1 over root x plus 3 plus root x plus 3, which is 1 over 2 square root x plus 3. 
and that is my derivative. Any questions? Nope. All right. Well, cool. In that case, let's go ahead and move on to a couple of brief notes about differential. We can say if a function is differentiable, then it is also continuous. And this is really helpful. So if a function is differentiable, it is also continuous. It's not necessarily true the other way around. If a function is continuous, it might be differentiable, but it also might not be differentiable. Um, in order to be differentiable, two, well, really, there's two major things you need to check for. And those are it must be continuous. So all differentiable functions are continuous. Not all continuous functions are differentiable. Differentiable functions also must be what we call smooth. Um, you will, you'll also see it more commonly described as like no sharp turns. Um, so a good example of a function that isn't necessarily differentiable is the absolute value of x. If we sketch out a graph, it looks something like this. Right? Well, remember our whole big idea for the derivative is the derivative means slope. So if I pick a point here, well, you can tell me the slope right there. If I pick a point right here, you can tell me the slope. What if I pick the very center point? What's the slope? It's undefined, right, because we just have like a pointy bit. Um, we can actually draw quite a few different tangent lines at a bunch of different angles. So we have an undefined slope. Um, another way to think about it is the derivative at a point exists um, if the limit of the derivative from the left is equal to the limit of the derivative from the right. Because our derivative really is a limit. In order for it to exist, the limit from the left has to equal the limit from the right. So in this case, our slope from the left is negative 1. Our slope from the right is positive 1. Since these are the same, it's not differentiable there. Um, so if I were to draw out a graph, something like, eh, I don't know, this. Um, where would it be differentiable? Let's say I should probably put some markers on here. Um, minus one, minus two, minus three, so on. All right, just go ahead, holler it out. Where is this function differentiable and where is it not differentiable? Everywhere except negative one, two. Everywhere except negative 1 and 2. Perfect. So we could say it's differentiable from negative infinity to negative 1. That is an awful negative infinity. Union negative 1 to 2. Union 2 to infinity. Perfect. And the reason it isn't differentiable at negative 1 is because right? it's discontinuous at negative 1. Why is it not uh, differentiable at 2? Sure. Right. Is continuous at negative one and sharp turn at uh, positive two. All right. So these are just a couple of things to look at. Um, I guess in terms of functions you know, this means that your trig function tangent of x, which looks, if you'll recall, something like this, just repeated over and over again it's not going to be differentiable everywhere it's discontinuous. So at all of these asymptotes, tangent is not differentiable. OK. All right. Um, let's go ahead and 
talk briefly about, yeah, we'll go ahead and get started with uh, some differentiation rules. So, as I'm sure you're aware, taking the derivative using the definition of a derivative is not fun, um, especially for more complicated functions. So that's why we have our derivative rules. And these are shortcuts so that we don't have to use the definition of a derivative. Um, we'll mostly be covering a lot of the basic ones today, nothing too complicated. First off, the derivative of a constant, well, that is equal to zero. Um, the reason being, if you look at the slope of a constant, that has zero slope, so the derivative should be zero. Next, we have our power rule. Um, so if n is a constant, then we can say the derivative of x to the n is you bring down the power, decrease it by 1. So n times x to the n minus 1. A quick example would be like x to the 7th. The derivative is 7x to the 6th. All right. Um, we also have um, it's like a linearity rule is what it's technically called. Um, you probably don't need to remember that. I'm not going to call it a product rule because that's something else. But basically if we have a constant being multiplied by some other part of our derivative of our function, we can actually just pull that function out. Yeah, that constant out, sorry. Um, so if we even wanted to take the derivative of a more complicated function, like a, well, x squared plus 3x, well, there's a common 3 in here. So I can even just pull that out and say it's 3 times the derivative of this inside part. Um, next one, we have an addition rule. So if we have two functions that are being added together, well, we can just take their derivative separately. Uh, is E considered a constant? Yes, E is actually a number by itself. It's like 2.718-ish. Um, it's, you can think of it as being a lot like pi. It's just a constant. It's special. It shows up in a lot of places. So we gave it a special name. Um, the big thing though is when you have a function like e to the x, well, suddenly e is no longer just a constant. It's a base for an exponent. Um, and this is not the same as your power rule. You'll notice that while these do look kind of similar, they are not at all the same because in one, x is your base, and the other, x is your exponent. So the way we handle this is the derivative of e to the x is actually just e to the x. But you are right, the derivative of just e by itself is 0 because e is a constant. In fact, if we take the derivative of even e to any like just other constant, this is still just a number. So this is still just zero. But as soon as we have a variable in there, it's different. Mm -hmm. That is a good question. A lot of people tend to uh, forget that e is a number and have no clue what to do with it. It's a good question. Uh, all right, let's do a couple of quick examples. Um, and then I'm going to make you do a bunch of derivatives because the best way to remember these is to just practice. So, cool. All right, so let's say I wanted to take the derivative of this. Well, first off, 
I can break it apart using my uh, addition rule. So I can say that the derivative of all of this is going to be the derivative of 4x cubed plus the derivative of e to the x plus the derivative of minus 1 over x. Well, for this first one, I can use my uh, multiplication by a constant rule to pull my 4 out. And I know for some of you this might be a bit slow um, because I'm going through a very uh, painfully slowly, well not, not really painfully slowly, I'm just showing all of my steps because I want to illustrate just how all of these uh, different derivative rules play into each other. So first off, I'm pulling my 4 out here um, using my multiplication by constant rule. My second one, I already know how to take the derivative of it because it's already in the form of one of my derivative rules that I've got so far. So I'm just going to go ahead and take the derivative. This last one, I'm actually also going to pull out a negative 1 using my multiplication by a constant rule. And I'm also going to rewrite it. Because 1 over x is the same thing as x to the minus first power. Well, now this part matches one of my derivative rules. It matches my x to the n rule. So I can use the power rule to find the derivative of that. Move down the constant, decrease it by 1. I've already taken the derivative of my e to the x. I don't worry about it. This last one, it's also in the form of my power rule. So I can move down my exponent, which is minus 1. I keep my minus 1 that I previously had, and then I decrease my exponent by 1. Um, one common mistake is a lot of people think, oh, minus 1, I decrease, and then it goes to 0. The problem is we actually need to decrease it by 1 by subtracting 1. So this is not right. Um, we need to subtract 1, which gives us negative 2. Um, and I did it. I'll still do it occasionally just because it's like, oh, 1 goes to 0, easy peasy. Just make sure you're thinking about it carefully. And then lastly, we just finish simplifying. You get 12x squared plus e to the x, and then plus 1 over x squared. Because I multiply my negatives, get a positive, and then rewrite this as a fraction. And this would be our derivative. All right. Cool. Any questions with the example? All right. Let's go ahead and do a bunch of practice problems here. Uh, you're asked to find the derivative. Um, I would suggest using the derivative rules. You're allowed to use the definition of a derivative if you really want to.
that's cool. Let's go over these. So this first one, I'm going to just rewrite by bringing my negative x by bringing my denominator up to the numerator as a negative exponent. Now I can just use my power rule, bring my power down, decrease it by one, and this is my derivative. Um, I'm just going to call them all y prime. My second one, uh, the first portion is already in a, in a way that we can just use our power rule. We would have three times, bring the exponent down, we have three times three gives us nine, decrease the exponent by one, and then add the derivative of e to the x, which is of course e to the x. Our third one, we can rewrite our first part with the negative exponent. And then just take the derivative. Of course, the derivative of x to the minus first. We would use our power rule. That gives minus 1 times x to the minus 2. So then minus 1 over x squared. Derivative of e to the x is e to the x. And the, the derivative of 3, because 3 is a constant, goes to 0. Our last one, we can just take the derivative straight across. Derivative of 3 is 0. Derivative of x is 1 because it would be, it has an exponent of 1. It would be like saying 1 multiplied by x to the 0 by our power rule. x to the 0 is just 1. So that gives 1. Um, derivative of x squared would be 2x to the 1 first power. Then you would have 4 times 3 gives 12 times x decrease the power by 1 and plus e to the x. So our final derivative is 1 plus 2x plus 12x squared plus e to the x. Any questions? Yep, it's pretty straightforward, right? <laughs> OK, um, so we've taken the derivative of these functions. Um, is there anything from stopping us from taking the derivative again? No, right. Um, so we actually can take the derivative as many times as we want. Um, sometimes it doesn't make a dif difference taking the derivative again. Sometimes we can keep taking the derivative forever, and we'll get a different function each time. Um, but looking at just this second function, this last one, sorry, I could take the second derivative, and this time I'm going to denote, denote it with two primes. It's just the derivative of this first one. Derivative of 1 is 0. Derivative of 2x is 2. Derivative of 12x squared is 24x. Derivative of e to the x is e to the x still. And another way we could denote this is e squared y over dx squared um, if we denote our first one by dy dx. Um, and this is like saying the derivative of y with respect to x. But that's just another way we can write our derivatives. Um, for higher powers, we usually don't like to do like this because then you have to count. So we'll put a little number in parentheses like this. And this would mean the third derivative. So that would be the derivative of our second derivative. So 24 plus e to the x. Now, there are some special applications of uh, derivatives that you'll probably run into a lot in your class. So first off, let's say you have a position function. I'm going to call it h of x is a position function. Which 
and I'm going to go with h of t. Well then, your first derivative is a velocity function. Your second derivative is an acceleration function. And these are really the two main things you should know, or I guess three. If you have a position function, then its first derivative is velocity and its second derivative is acceleration. Um, you can technically keep taking the derivative, and the third derivative is something called jerk. The fourth derivative is pretty rarely used, so uh, there are a couple of different names for it, one of which is jounce, the other is like, uh, I want to say snap, um, but then no one, hardly anyone actually uses it, so you probably won't even see jerk ever, <laughs> but uh, I think jounce is a funny name, so I decided to say it. Um, but yeah, let's do a couple of... Uh, practice problems involving some more uh, applications of this. So let's say you have um, so a ball is dropped from a arbitrarily tall cliff. We're going to call it 100 meters. It's quite tall. Um, and we're going to say its position after t seconds is given by h of t is equal to minus 4.9 t squared plus 100. So first off, find a velocity function and then tell me what is the velocity when t is equal to 2 and second find an acceleration function. And again, what is the acceleration at t is equal to 2?
to two supposed to be two. Uh, no, that is supposed to be second, uh, two. Um, because I wrote the function and then I realized that the rocket was falling at first. So I decided to say we're not going to look at the first couple seconds. <laughs> Uh, sorry, I just saw this question. Is the first derivative instantaneous? The first derivative is always instantaneous velocity. Um, average velocity comes from uh, basically your slope formula. So if we sketched out a position time graph, your average velocity you could find by taking two points and drawing a line between them. Your instantaneous velocity is going to be your slope at a single point. And that's going to be your derivative. So slope is always, or your derivative is always instantaneous velocity.
average velocity is the slope of the secant line. That's correct. All right, let's go ahead and go over these. Um, for this first one, of course, velocity function is, like I said earlier, the derivative of position. So our velocity would be our derivative of our position function, which would give us minus 4.9 times 2 times t to the first plus 0. So simplifying gives us negative 9.8. And then to find our velocity at time t equals 2, we just plug in 2 into our velocity equation. That gives us negative 19.6. Um, I guess we could use units in meters per second since I specified meter tall cliff, t seconds. But it's math. Um, I don't care too much about units at this point. So <laughs> um, next we can find our acceleration function. And acceleration is, of course, just the derivative of our velocity function. So the derivative of our velocity function would be negative 9.8 times uh, the derivative of t. The derivative of t is just 1. So this is our acceleration function. Our acceleration at 2, then, is still just negative 9.8. All right, for this next one, again, velocity is just the derivative of position. In this case, we would have 1 fourth times 4 cancels to make 1. We're left with t cubed plus 2 times 3 gives us 6. t squared minus 2t, derivative of 4 is 0. And then, of course, for our velocity at 3, we just plug in 3, we get 27 plus 18 minus 6, and that goes to 39. What? Uh, 3 squared times 6. You are right. That is not at all right. Okay. Perfect. So plus uh, 3 squared is 9 times 64, so minus 6. That's going to give us... Six, uh, 75? Yeah. Perfect. And I didn't actually specify units this time in height, so we would have something per second, but that's okay. Now we could find our acceleration function, and that's going to be our derivative of velocity. So our velocity function was t cubed plus 60 squared minus 2t. Derivative, we basically just use the power rule a bunch. And then we can find our acceleration at time 3. And that would be 3 times 3. Five sixty-one. Perfect. Any questions? All right. In that case, we'll go with maybe a couple more practice problems and then call it good. Um, I believe you only just started learning about quotient rule and product rule this week. We kind of finished the pretty sure. Uh, let's see, today's Tuesday. When was your lecture on it? Monday. Uh, last lecture was finishing product and quotient, and then we started like the first 10 minutes of trigonometry. Okay, okay. Um, so you started product and quotient last Friday then? Yeah, like last, yeah, I think so, yeah. All right. In that case, we will touch very briefly on product rule and quotient rule. Um, and maybe also talk a little bit about notation. I think I'll mostly just cover that in the next one, though. So if you remember, or actually, you probably don't remember since you haven't really learned it. Um, one way we like to represent 
functions to make things easier is saying like u is a function of x. Um, Can I go over graphing derivatives if I have time? Um, sure, I'll just explain really briefly the product rule and the quotient rule, and then I can talk about some graphing derivatives. Um, u is a function of x. Then we can also say that like v is a function of x. Well then, if we wanted to take the derivative of these two functions of x that were multiplied together, We say it's the first one times the derivative of the second plus the derivative of first, the first times the second normally. And this is known as the product rule. Um, this is very important. Definitely memorize this. Um, and then we also have a quotient rule. Um, And this is similar. It's basically the product rule. If you just, uh, it really is the product rule in disguise. If you just say, well, v is 1 over v now, we can think of it as multi tanking u and multiplying by 1 over v. Um, but it's usually easier to just remember the quotient rule, which is low times the derivative of the high minus high times the derivative of the low all over low, low. So over v squared. Um, a quick example we could do. Let's say I wanted to take the derivative of x plus 2 times x plus 3. Well, then by my product rule, I would have the first one, x plus 2, times the derivative of the second one. Derivative of x plus 3 is just 1. Plus the derivative of the first one, derivative of x plus 2 is just 1. Um, because the derivative of x is 1, derivative of 2 is 0, so 1 plus 0 gives 1. Then we leave the second alone, and this gives x plus 2 plus x plus 3, 2x plus 5. And we can verify that this is the same by multiplying this out. x squared plus 2x plus 3x is 5x plus 6, and then taking the derivative, we give 2x plus 5. And we can see that these are the same. If we wanted to do a quick example with the quotient rule, well, we could say we have uh, low x plus 3 times the derivative of high times 1 plus high x plus 3 times the derivative x plus 2, sorry, times the derivative of low, so multiplied by the derivative of x plus 3, which is 1, all over low, low. Um, sorry if I'm using this mnemonic, I should probably explain that. Um, low d high minus high d low over low low. It just says take your bottom function, multiply by the derivative of the top function, the high function, subtract the high function times the derivative of the bottom function, all over the bottom function squared. Um, that's how it was taught to me, so I can never forget it, and <laughs> I, don't, I haven't seen anyone else taught that way, so uh, <laughs> it's just a weird quirk of mine, I guess. I learned it that way, too. But you I learned it that way? Through YouTube videos, not through my teacher. Ah, fair. Um, but yeah, if we finish simplifying this, we would have x plus 3 times 1 is x plus 3, plus x plus 2 gives 2x plus 5, right? Yeah, 2x plus 5 all over x plus 3. Squared. And that's the product rule and the quotient rule. They're both uh, pretty important. I would recommend um, just memorizing them because you will do them for all of calculus. <laughs> um, so lastly, you wanted to go over some graphing derivatives. Um, let's see. So I'm not quite sure what you want when you say graphing derivatives, because if you're given a function for your original, 
um, like even if it's like just some random polynomial? Well, you can always just find an explicit formula for your derivative and then just graph that. Like you know how to graph 2x plus 3. So what I'm assuming is you maybe mean something like you're given a graph of f of x like this and you're asked to sketch the derivative. Is that kind of what you mean? All right. So really there are a couple of things you can do. Um, what's always helpful to start out is start by looking where your tangent line is horizontal. So there are two points on this sketch that I made, one right here and one right here, where our tangent line is going to be horizontal, right? Well, when the tangent line is horizontal, that means we have a slope of zero. And when we have a slope of zero, that tells because our slope is our derivative, that our derivative should be zero at those points. Now, wherever we have a positive slope, that tells us that our derivative is positive because we have a positive slope, and the slope is the derivative. In other words, our derivative should be above our y-axis, uh, above our x-axis, sorry. So to the left of this point that I drew right here, we should have a positive derivative, something like that. Um, similarly, wherever we have a negative slope, our derivative should be below the x-axis in a negative y value. Um, there are, I guess there's like a little bit, of, bit more you could go off of. Um, talking about like concavity, have you heard that word at all? All right, you will, there's going to be quite a bit of a, uh, in your next few lectures, and probably for the rest of the semester, honestly, you'll be discussing a few other things like concavity, um, which is basically, is my function cup-shaped or bowl-shaped? So you can see, if I were to draw two sketches, both of these are increasing. Both of these have positive slope, but they're clearly different. We call this one concave down, and basically what it means is that your second derivative is negative. This one is concave up, and that means your second derivative is positive. <laughs> um, you will address all of this later in the course. For now, if you're looking at sketching derivatives, I would look first, where are my points where I have zero slope? because that's where my derivatives is going to be zero. And then look at where is my function increasing, so where should I have a positive slope versus where should I have a negative slope. Um, is that kind of good enough for a, uh... oh, the written equation, sorry, the written equation has nothing to do with the graph. Um, <laughs> it was just a random example I was throwing out there. Uh, this is just a whole different, a whole separate graph that I made up. Um, but yeah, in general, looking at the equation, just look for the points where you have zero slope and then consider, am I, should I have positive slope or negative slope? <laughs> All right, does that help uh, with uh, graphing derivatives? All right, perfect, perfect. Anything else you guys wanted to go over? All right, then. In that case, thank you all for coming. I'm going to stop recording.